The Rolfs have been enthralled with Hearthstone since the 1970s when they moved to the Fox Cities. Joan was the department chairperson of interior design and developed the interior design program for Fox Valley Technical College 50 years ago in 1971. She started when she was 10 years old. <laughs> Joan was contacted by a member of the Friends of Hearthstone board and invited to become involved with the restoration of Hearthstone. They also invited Robin to become involved because of his background in electronics and electricity. Realizing the Edison connection and the historical importance of the house, they both eagerly accepted and have been instrumental ever since. They've helped with displays down there. They've written a number of books. Uh, in 2021, they were the featured speaker for the Antique Light Bulb Conference. And how many here attended the Antique? <laughs> just two, just two. The Antique Light Bulb Conference in Baltimore, Maryland. The conference was covered by CBS Sunday Morning. Joan has a BS degree in business interior design. Robin has a BS and an MS in technology education. They are also owners of Audio Antique LLC, a business that specializes in vintage phonographs. Without further ado, please welcome Joan and Robin Ross, who are going to talk about the Hearthstone, America's National Electrical Revenue. Well, thank you. We're delighted to be here. My name is Joan Rolfs, this is my husband Robin, and uh, we wrote this book, Hearthstone, America's Electrical National Treasure. Uh, now, this wasn't our first book that we ever wrote. We uh, started out writing a book on, phone we love phonographs, those old talking machines. So our first book was Phonograph Dolls That Talk and Sing. Well, as you can see, we wrote that quite a while ago, and uh, it sold out, and we were um, actually contacted by a publisher out in California, Mulholland Press, and they said, why don't you write a book on phonograph dolls and toys? Well, this has also been a success, and uh, it's uh, sold out, you get second printings. But we also wrote other books as well. Rob, you want to tell them about that? They'll really be intrigued here. <laughs> The Victor Talking Machine Company, which was the most famous for making the, uh, the early phonographs and Victrolas, uh, they have a mascot, a trademark, called his master's voice. And Nipper is the dog looking into the horn of the, of the talking machine or gramophone. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of different types of collectibles that phonograph collectors and people like ourselves collect. And we thought we'd document as many as we could uh, that, that we were familiar with. So we wrote this, this book on nipper collectibles. And then we found out there were more and we wrote volume two. <laughs> and? There are still more. He was really the icon of the 20th century. We had, we had no intention of writing a three volumes when we, when we started this project, but people kept coming up to us and saying, hey, you, I looked through your book and I didn't see this object in it. And so we collected enough for volume, volume three. three. And that's, that's, it. <laughs> that's it. But tonight we are here uh, to talk about Another book that we wrote, Hearthstone's America Electric National Treasure. And yes, we did go to Baltimore, and yes, there are light bulb collectors throughout the United States and the nation. Well, where do we 
why are we writing this book? Well, because of course we're involved with Hearthstone for the last 30 some years. But the inspiration for our book, believe it or not, started at the Edison National Historic Park in Orange, New Jersey. We worked with them on uh, different projects. One was the Edison Talking Doll, which made national news. I was thrilled when she made the New York Times and she didn't even kill anybody or rob anybody. So anyway, we do work with them and we go there probably twice a year. Well, we were in my favorite room there, which is Edison's office, and I was looking at the genius of electricity statue. And uh, my voice carries. And uh, long uh, as I was saying there, Rob, look at that. I think it's a hairpin filament. And, and along came that young man over there. And he said, I think you're interested in light bulbs. And we said, well, I got out my trusty phone. And I said, we work with Hearthstone. And uh, I showed him pictures of the interiors. And he said, those are Bergman fixtures. Now, I know nobody here probably heard of Bergman but you'll learn about him tonight. And so anyway, he shared his knowledge and provided us with the Bergman lighting catalogs from 1883 and 84. Yes, 30 years later, we were able to identify the light fixtures at Hearthstone House Museum. Now, Henry J. and Camara Rogers um, built this house, which we feel is an historical gem. The house is named Hearthstone because it has nine fireplaces. Built in 1882, it is the world's first home to be lit by an Edison Central hydroelectric station. One month after formation, the Appleton Edison Light Company Limited began supplying Edison power from a water-powered dynamo to light the lamps of the Rogers home as well as two nearby paper mills, and on September 30th, 1882, made history as it became the first central hydroelectric station using the Edison system. Now there are only three, only three residences in the United States that are known to have electric light when Hearthstone system was completed on September 1882. The William Henry Vanderbilt House, you know, the Vanderbilts. Okay, that was completed in January 1882. And then we have J.P. Morgan. <laughs> His house was unreal. That was completed the summer of 1882. And then there was a John Dorn House in um, Chicago. He was like a merchandiser, like Marshall Fields. And that was in August. 1882 in Chicago. Now these three residences, in, it, well the Morgan residence, but you could put Hearthstone in their living room. But, but only the residence that remains with these wonderful lecturers is Hearthstone. Now what makes Hearthstone so compelling is that Henry Rogers was an industrialist and president of the Appleton Gas Company. He had the motivation and the foresight to invest in this new technology, electricity, and it hadn't even been proven. In fact, Thomas Edison was still constructing his first large-scale central station in Lower Manhattan when Henry Rogers signed a contract in June 1882 with the Western Edison Light Company of Chicago for two Edison Type K dynamos. Now, electric fixtures and fittings from the time of Hearthstone are known as electroliers, and wall sconces are known as brackets. And the fixtures in Hearthstone are some of the oldest known in existence. During the summer of 1878, Edison, at the age of 32, decided to tackle what had frustrated so many other scientists and inventors before him. That is to perfect a safe, reliable, and inexpensive light source by using incandescence. 
It seemed a simple enough project. After all, he boasted he could, he could probably finish the job in two months. Although the concept of developing an electric light using uh, the principle of incandescence or heating a filament had long been pursued by others, and had countless demonstrations of it had been given, only Edison had the resources and the stamina to develop a practical lamp. After over 6,000 frustrating failed experiments, and 18 months later, he discovered the right combination. He realized that the filament needed to be high resistance. A simple piece of sewing thread baked in a carbonizing oven and then sealed in a glass envelope that had a vacuum. That proved to be the answer to the incandescent lamp. Yet to make the invention viable, he would also require a complete generating system, distribution system, safeguards, installment equipment. No one before him had the resources or the determination to produce a lamp that could compete with the lighting of gas that was used at the day. So Edison really didn't come up with the concept of an electric lamp or light, but he was the first to make it work as a practical device for illumination. Now, in 1867, at the young age of 18, coming over from Germany alone on a boat, Johann Sigmund Bergman emigrated to the United States and he had extreme well-honed machine shop skills. He quickly established himself as a skilled machinist and a shrewd businessman. He built a machine shop in New York doing business as S. Bergman Company. There he manufactured hotel and house annunciators, batteries, and electrical apparatus of all kinds. But by the mid-1870s, he had a firm working relationship with Thomas Edison. There he was lending his talents as an inventor and an outstanding manufacturer for Edison's inventions. Well, he soon saw his future in teaming with Edison and in manufacturing the first lighting fixtures, switches, the connectors, the sockets, and the shades. And by 1882, Bergman was constructing a magnificent showroom devoted solely to electric light fixtures specifically made by Thomas Edison's so that they would fit Thomas Edison's incandescent lamp. The new lamps allowed flexibility of design that couldn't be achieved with an open flame. For the first time in history, you didn't have to rely on fire for light. Each, each of these incandescent lamps at the time of Hearthstone would have cost the customer about a dollar sixty apiece. The electric uh, company would charge an additional dollar twenty per lamp for all night service, or if you only used your lamps until ten o'clock, it was eighty-four cents per lamp per month. It's estimated that the Rogers home had about 50 of these Edison incandescent lamps. And that's about $80 there. And then every month, 
there was a charge. And if Rogers was using his lights all night, there would be additional $60 a month. So these lamps were not inexpensive. Well, we're talking about Bergman and his catalogs featured hundreds of intricate designs and accessories for this new source of lighting. And those are some pages from the catalog that Cremora could select her lighting fixtures from. Now, as president of the local gas company, it was not surprising that Henry Rogers had his house plumbed for gas uh, during its early construction in 1880-81. By the spring of 1882, Rogers was so convinced that Edison's incandescent lighting with electricity generated by water power was achievable, that gas lighting was never installed. The Bergman brackets and lectureliers installed in the Rogers home reflect the total modern approach to lighting of its day. Many of the lampshades date from the 1880s and they allow the bulbs to protrude. The original bulbs to the house would have been hairpin filaments similar to the reproduction carbon filaments that we now use in the, the fixtures and when you go there and we say it's light as day, everybody goes, it's so dark. Well, as trends changed and new lampshades replaced the 1880 style shades, however, it seemed that each family had a reverence for the history of the house. They preserved the lectureliers, the switches, the electrical artifacts for future generations to appreciate. And Hearthstone had many of the original 1882 lectureliers and brackets. So that's why we say it is indeed a national treasure. Now, as an interior designer, I cannot imagine, and if you could imagine, ladies, you, he's a president of the gas company. He's, she's probably selected these wonderful gas fixtures. But no, she gets the Bergman catalog and has to select electrical fixtures, which I don't think she even thought about. But anyway, uh, we know that the house was origi originally piped for gas, and we know that only electric was used. So now let's take a tour of the few of the beautiful rooms at Hearthstone House Museum, showing the original fixtures. Let's start in the Grand Hall. Ah, oh, the Grand Hall was designed to impress visitors as they entered the home and it served as a passageway to other areas of the home. Displayed here is Bergman number 505. I got that from the catalog. With four lights costing $44 in 1882. The shades may not be original, however, uh, we do know that they are from 1885, and they are glass flowers. Now, the parlor, that's where we're going to take you next because you are such special guests. The parlor represented a place to entertain important guests and present a really feeling of grandeur. And Cremora, I'm sure, would have invited many Appleton socialites to a formal afternoon tea. And this room has Bergman, number 500 Lectrolier, with six lights costing $49.50. And most importantly, she selected two Bergman numbers 561 swinging bracket fixtures. I can't tell you how important these are. They are shown in the center of the window frame on each end of the parlor. Now the shades are reproductions, but they are uh, shades that are not original, but they are 1880 shades. The sitting room is plain. That's where we're gonna go. Let's go upstairs now. Oh, the sitting room isn't as glamorous as the lower rooms, but it, Compared to the other rooms, this was a rather functional rather than formal room, a gathering place for the family. Now, the upper sitting room features a lecture similar to the Burglum number 31 
that cost $36.50. The Rogers had one teenage daughter. Her name was Kitty. And, you know, only one daughter, she gets spoiled. So she got to select whatever she wanted. And in her bedroom, she had the latest trend. And that is a full painted brick fireplace. Yeah, the trend, you know how trends go up and down? The colonial trend was coming back in 1882. Okay, the Hearthstone um, rooms here feature um, the Bergman number 23 swinging bracket. And uh, the electroliers that you see here are also in the guest room. I think Primor just gave up and let's say, let's have everything the same upstairs. And um, anyway, uh, they also have their, uh, the, they feature four of the unique Bergman number 561 swinging arm fixtures. And these are so important because we just had two experts come, one from uh, Illinois and one from Baltimore. And they were enthralled. I mean, they were drooling over these fixtures because they had never seen one of these before. And here it is, right here in Appleton, Wisconsin, in Hearthstone Historic House Museum. Well, Hearthstone is fortunate to have some of the rare electrical artifacts that may not be known anywhere else, or at least be accessible for public viewing. Light switches that are used throughout the house still function today. They're heavily constructed cast iron housing with a heavy brass turnkey handle and a spring-loaded cam assembly that would have connected 110 DC volts to the electroliers. Our museum's lower level has interesting displays that tell the story of the electrical technology and features that are used in the construction of the house. In 1882, several manufacturers of incandescent lamps appeared but most of these companies had incompatible sockets and designs that didn't work at all with each other. And now I'm going to have a little quiz for you guys. We'll see if you can have the answer to this because you've all used it before, but let's see. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about our displays. And what do these two things have in common? We see a light bulb and a kerosene can. Hmm. Well, Francis Yale, a young man who worked for Edison since he was 16 and then became just a, an incredible uh, assistant to him, relates this account. When preparations for a second exposition got underway, Edison took up the subject of socket and lamp base again. You know, you have to screw in those bulbs. He knew these must be constructed so the lamp could be held securely in any position and at the same time furnish a good connection. Quote, unquote. One night in the early part of 1880, while the master was talking on the subject to some of his assistants, he noticed a kerosene oil can standing nearby. Taking it up and unscrewing the cover, he studied the combination for a while and explained, this certainly can make a bang-up socket for a lamp, as well as a base. Thus, the Edison screw socket, if you've ever, anybody ever screwed in a, Light bulb? Uh-huh. Okay. That's it. It was born there in 1880. Now, technology has changed the way light is produced through the years, but guess what? We, the basic screw-in base is still used and has the elements of that old kerosene can. Amazing. 
So Bergman patented the Edison screw base socket, revolutioned the, the design of flexibility of lamps, lectureliers, safety de devices, and installation devices and attachments. Now you can go to home and screw in a bulb and know how it came to be. <laughs> well, now it's time for a great fishing story. <laughs> and it uh, all started on a warm spring day in June. Roger's old pal from Fond du Lac, H.E. Jacobs, arrived in Appleton, and the two decided to take the day off and go fishing on Lake Winnebago. Well, the fish weren't really biting that well, and they were just sitting in the boat, and Jacobs began telling Rogers about the new job that he had. So enthusiastic was he in describing his position of how Edison was constructing a large steam plant in lower New York to light electric lights in New York. His presentation to Rogers was so engaging that Rogers soon lost all interest in fishing. He is quoted later, what kept going through my mind was this one idea. If a steam plant can make electricity to burn Edison lights, why couldn't water power? Well, I came home, I was more interested in that unknown electricity than anything else for a long time. Now, since Jacobs, his new job was representative of the Western Edison Light Company of Chicago. Now, it didn't take long for a contract to be drawn up for the Edison Type K Dynamo, along with 250 lamps and the entire rights for incandescent lighting of the Fox Valley. It was the Edison, Western Edison Light Company where Rogers obtained the Type K dynamo and the lamps and the electrical equipment for installation of the hydroelectric system that he envisioned for the Appleton paper and pulp mill that he managed and also his new home. He was convinced that he could use the power of the Fox River to drive the Edison Dynamo. The firm's electrical engineer, P.D. Johnston from Chicago was invited to Appleton and in July of 1882, he came up to explain the Edison lighting system to investors. Well, Appleton owns its distinction of having been served by the world's first Edison hydroelectric lighting system, owes this to the courage and foresight of a small group of business leaders who were pioneering with Edison. These pioneers of 1882 had no predecessors, nothing to do with the electric lighting business. There was no model to follow. Edison's original central station at Pearl Street, New York was still under construction when the Appleton plant was being projected. Now the Appleton system, or the Edison system, had been, had been demonstrated, but its commercial success has not been tested yet. Let's briefly take a review of the Appleton Electric Utility Companies that resulted from Rogers' transactions through the years. This gets a little confusing, maybe. <laughs> First, there's the Appleton Edison Light Company Limited. This was formed by Rogers and Company. And the company began business in August 18th 1882, with one Type K dynamo of 12.5 kilowatts and 250 16 candle power, that's about 55 watts, 
of incandescent lamps. The customers were the Appleton Paper and Pulp mill that Rogers managed, along with the Rogers residence and the Kimberly and Clark Vulcan Paper Mill. Now, by the end of 1885, this company was serving over 39 customers and to meet expanding customer needs and improve the quality of service, a new 190 watt kilowatt plant was constructed in 1886. The site would have been near where the uh, Wisconsin Electric Center is, where Pullman's restaurant is, is roughly located. And it incorporated all the new features of the Edison system, including regulators, fuses, the Edison three-wire system, and 24-hour service. Then there's the Appleton Electric Railway Company. This was established in 1886 by the Harriman brothers. They installed and ran the Appleton streetcar service business using the Vanderpool system until 1891. Then they ran into financial difficulties, sold the plant, and uh, the uh, utility was bought by Augustus L. Smith and the Appleton Edison Light Company. Then Augustus Smith and Charles Beveridge then formed the Appleton Edison Electric Company. Well, there were some financial hardships and a catastrophic fire destroyed the old DC plant and this caused the enterprise to declare bankruptcy January 1896. Now, meanwhile, a few years earlier, A.C. Langstead secured financial backing from Westinghouse and formed the Citizens Electric Light and Power Company in 1894. There he installed modern alternating current generators and this forced the Appleton Edison Electric Company to cut its rates. Now this along with the fire forced Augustus Smith and the Appleton Edison Electric Company to pull the plug in January of 1896. Augustus Smith bought the bankrupt company. The Appleton Edison Light Company was sold for $125,000 and Smith formed the Appleton Electric Light and Power Company the very next day. One year later, he purchased the Citizens Electric light and power. Well, soon, Milwaukee capitalists led by John L. Beggs consolidated interurban traction and electric power throughout the state and in July 1901 bought Appleton Electric Light and Power Company. And now the future of Appleton and the Fox Valley Electric business was in the hands of the Milwaukee-based Wisconsin Traction Light Heat and Power Company. Further consolidation with Michigan interests led to the formation of Wisconsin Michigan Power Company and in year 2000 this company became We Energies. Wow, did you get all that? <laughs> That's history. Well, the Fox River dams provided water power for generating hydroelectricity. The dams which tamed the Fox River for navigation in the 1850s also provided water power for industry. Appleton had three dams 
to control a 38 foot drop in the river with the potential of 11,500 horsepower. Now the 26 mile stretch of the Lower Fox River running from Appleton to Lake Michigan and Green Bay provides cities and industry with abundance of water power equal to Niagara Falls. Hmm. Okay, during the mid 1800s, developers of paper mills found that this area was highly desirable for converting nearby timber into high quality paper products. In 1874, one developer, William Van Nortwick, along with investor Henry Rogers, purchased an old rake factory directly below the upper dam along with the water rights for $200,000. Their intentions? Build a paper mill. By 1876, the Appleton Paper and Pulp Company was a very successful enterprise managed by Henry Rogers. Now the property for the future Rogers' home was located directly above the paper mill on the north bank of the river. Water level in the foreground of these buildings is about 17 feet higher than the river. The water flowing from this level underneath the buildings provided the power to operate the machinery. The Type K Dynamo arrived in Appleton on August 1882 and it took approximately six weeks of installation, supervised by electrical engineer P.D. Johnson of the Western Edison Light Company and a local college student named William Kurtz. In fact, they named him the superintendent of the Appleton Edison Light Company. Edward O'Keefe engineered the water power equipment. The dynamo was located in the grinding or mulching area known as the beater room and connected by leather belts to a shaft of the level wheel, which is a turbine, that operated the beaters. Now, because of varying mechanical loads placed on the beater machinery, this affected the speed of the dynamo and voltage regulation was a serious problem. There were no electrical meters. And so what did William Kurtz have to do? He had to constantly monitor the output of the dynamo by visually looking at a light bulb, or as they called it, the brightness of the lamp suspended from a ceiling. The single dynamo lit lights in the Rogers paper mill along with lights in a nearby Vulcan mill as well as the Rogers home. Now because of the problems associated with maintaining the constant speed of the dynamo due to the varying loads of the beater, the dynamo was moved within a few weeks to a new location. This new location was a lean-to structure attached to the rag shed called the office. It now operated by its own water turbine, and it served well for the next three years, providing power to light the lights of Kimberly Clark, Vulcan Mill, Rogers Paper Mill, and his newly built home. Well, in October, a second dynamo arrived, and upon installation, it was placed in operation November 25th, 1882. The location was about a mile and a half east of the Appleton Paper and Pulp Mill on the far end of West Canal on Vulcan Street next to the Appleton Blast Furnace. This plant was specifically built to supply power to local residences and commercial customers. This third location of the hydroelectric uh, plant became known as the Vulcan Street Hydroelectric Central Station. Now, a fire destroyed the original Vulcan Street Station building in 1896. The station has the distinction of being known as the world's first 
central hydroelectric power station using the Edison system, which is an independent plant specifically constructed and centrally located to supply electric power to surrounding residential and commercial customers. The plant provided power to light the lights of three more residences and five industrial sites. By the end of 1885, the two Type K dynamos were serving a 30, uh, total of 39 customers, including the, the Waverly Hotel in downtown Appleton and Lawrence University. A plan to replicate the old Vulcan plant to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the Edison Hydroelectric Central Power Station was conceived in 1928. The Wisconsin Michigan Power Company was placed in charge of the product, project and they had a problem. Securing an original Type K dynamo. Where do you find them? The only known examples were in the possession of Henry Ford at the Edison Institute of Technology in Dearborn. Now, in doing our research, I found that Mr. Ford wanted to replicate the hydro plant at Deerfield Village. But after meeting with the Appleton City Fathers, they convinced him that it should be here for the celebration. And he not only enthusiastically supported the project, but agreed to supply one Type K dynamo, which we still have here in Appleton, from his museum, put it in first class working order, sent it via Ford truck, how else? In addition, he would furnish some bulbs, the type used in the Appleton Edison Light Company. Now, in constructing the Vulcan plant, it was decided to raise the structure above ground level so that the flume and water wheel would be, could be examined from below. And now, for excitement, we're going to show you exactly how this Vulcan plate works. Right here in Appleton, Wisconsin, you have Hearthstone and the Vulcan plant. These are definitely historic landmarks, and I hope you all visit and appreciate them. The Vulcan plant is definitely an historic landmark named for the Vulcan Street location. It is also a National Historic Engineering Landmark for the American Society of Civil Engineers, a landmark for the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, and a landmark for the Institute of Electrical and Electronic Engineers. And it still works today, right, Laura? <laughs> Well, Edison said, I will make electric lights so cheap that only the rich will be able to afford candles. <laughs> it was a dawn of electricity. And right here in Appleton, Wisconsin, we have Hearthstone House Museum with the most important electroliers and light fixtures in the world. We also have the Vulcan plant. And of course, if you haven't visited these places, you definitely should be as Appleton residences. But if that's out of the question, we did write this wonderful book on Hearthstone, America's Electrical National Treasure. And now, if you have any questions, we could entertain them. But thank you. I don't know if you've seen the headlines. No light, no power. Mills down, cars are not running, ice jams. The plant of the Wisconsin Traction Light Heat and Power Company is paralyzed. Not an interurban or local car wheel turned since 11.20 o'clock last night. The situation in Appleton is intense. Backwater in the tail race at the plant 
which flooded the machine room caused by an ice gorge that formed at the St. Paul and Northwestern Trestle Bridge in the flats is responsible. The cable pits at the electric light plant are under eight inches of water. Minute pumps have been forced, have been working hard since the enforced shutdown last night, keeping the water out of the generator pits. The steel pans and closing the pit walls are not substantial enough to resist the pressure of the backwater, which is squirting through at an alarming rate. A hundred men are working to break the gorge and release the water. No relief is in sight. Hundreds of pounds of dynamite are being used to break the mass of ice in the channel of the river. All needles have been pulled up from the big dam. The St. Paul Company sent a big crew of men to assist in fighting the ice at the trestle. Workmen are opening a channel from the needle dam to the trestle bridge to help break the gorge by natural suction of the river. What condition will be when water is lowered is problematical. General Manager Ellis can give absolutely no statement as to when power can be restored. Appleton has perhaps never been hit so hard. Hundreds of homes were without light last night. Social functions in progress were broken up, especially dances. All institutions depending on electrical energy were silent today. Intense cold makes work of relieving the situation many fold more difficult. Fred Wickman, streetcar employee, fell into the river at the trestle while assisting in breaking the ice jam. He escaped drowning on account of the solid wall of ice. Most of the dentists and jewelers are crippled as their electrically operated machines are motionless. And you have an abbreviated newspaper today, somewhat changed with regard to typeface and in greatly abbreviated form, herewith presents its best efforts under the circumstances. Lack of electric power crippled every department of the plant. Now, city engineer Vanal and the division engineer of the Northwestern Railroad were in telephonic communication shortly before noon, the latter having called up to find out what can be best done to remedy the water and the ice situation. Vinnell recommended that expert dynamite handlers be rushed to the city so that charges from five to 10 pounds of explosive could be set off at a time to blow out the ice jammed against the railway trestle. Inexperienced men, it is feared, might blow out the bridge, ice and all. There is talk this afternoon of blowing out sections of the two railway bridges to release the ice and water. This will be done unless relief can be secured some other way. Now, downriver mills are crippled. Most of the downriver mills are crippled. Many of the employees live in Appleton and were unable to get to work this morning because interurban service ceased. Now, F.J. Harwood of the Appleton <coughs> Woolen Mills Company furnished about 100 pairs of mittens for the men engaged in breaking up the ice gorge at the St. Paul Trestle. Thoughtful and fine. Then, pennies scattered to the winds. A penny shower occurred at the corner of College Avenue and Morrison Street yesterday morning. A box carried by John Stevens Jr. containing Sunday school money suddenly sprung a leak. You can imagine the rest. 
Who knows what people will do for a little cold cash. <laughs> the mercury this morning registered variously from 24 to 28 below zero. No relief is promised. The weather report saying the cold will be continued at least another day. At the university, Brokaw Hall, Stevenson Hall of Science, and Ormsby Hall, three of the largest buildings at Lawrence College, are practically without heat today as a result of the shutting down of the electric power plant. The vapor system employed in heating those buildings is operated in part by a fan which is electrically operated. When the fan ceased operation, heat was available on a very limited degree. Girls at Ormsby Hall and the boys at Brokaw Hall were obliged to keep well wrapped while in their rooms. Now, not to fear, this ad appears in the paper as well. No power, no electric light, 18 below zero, high winds, no streetcars, county roads blocked. In spite of it all, a most successful rummage sale at Pettibones. <laughs> the stay-at-homes will be amply rewarded for the effort needed to go to Pettibones to spend a few hours and a little money. The rummage sale, closing out the Wharton China store, and the fire sale of sweaters. Three big sales in one big store. A little bit of history of Appleton from Wednesday, January 10th, 1912.